You are watching Aboriginal TV Channel 4 as well as listening to Larrakia Radio and Australian Indigenous Radio of the Vast Satellite 913 going out to 2,400 communities across Australia. My name is Rachel and in the studio with me now is the Honourable Ken Wyatt, AM, Federal Minister of Indigenous Australians. Thank you, Ken, so much for coming to the studio. It's great to be back up here again. I, I enjoyed the last time I came in here and... We had a great discussion on there and it's important we share information with our people and our communities. It was a great discussion that we had um, when you were up here for the Aboriginal Economic Development Forum. That's right, yes. It was about the way in which we realise the assets we have. So land up here is important and to their credit, let me say, the um, land councils are now looking at the economic opportunities because we can't afford to let these go because it means income or money coming in it also means training and jobs for our people in the long term minister wyatt it has been a big 2019 for you can you please give us just an overview of what you've done uh since may i suppose the first thing was the speech i did in which i said that we would look at recognition in the constitution and would address the issues that were captured in uh, the statement from the heart because I think uh, the intent uh, that's in there is about voice. It was never described. And so I put into place a strategic group that is now looking at what the voice might look like at a local, regional and national level. I will announce two other groups, one that will look at the national voice and a third one that will look at local voices because every time I'm in the communities, I talk to elders and I talk to traditional owners first. Uh, because if we talk about saying we respect our elders, but we don't talk with them and engage them, then there's something wrong. And then I meet with the groups that I have to have the yarns with about the issues. So, and let me say, all of them are saying to me, what about our voice at the community level? And what have they been saying to you? Well, well they've talked about land tenure. When I was in... The Territory recently, the traditional owners talked about them being left out and not being part of many of the discussions. They talked about the frustration of information not coming to them, and I can understand that. Uh, But more importantly, they are the traditional owners, so they need to be involved. And at some point, I'd encourage all of our organisations, including our peak bodies, to start engaging with traditional owners and elders, because if we want to acknowledge them, then we need to demonstrate that we do respect our elders and we're going to involve them in the way in which we make decisions. Yeah, Yeah, because um, when we think of, you know, Aboriginal people, people, the greater community thinks of those that live on the coast or in those major townships. But Aboriginal people culture also goes out into the communities and we have to strengthen and listen to those people so we as a a group, as a people, can strengthen and survive. We need to do that and we also need to do it in capital cities as well because capital cities have uh, large pockets of Aboriginal people living in certain suburbs. In my uh, electorate of Hasluck, around Midland, uh, I have the equivalent number of Aboriginal people equal to the population of the Kimberley. So it's a large number that live in an urban setting. So I have to look at how we also uh, sit and talk with our people at that level. Um, But what's more important is those in the bush who often don't have ministers or don't have senior officials come and meet them regularly to talk to them about the issues such as water, quality of water, education, uh, the roads, houses and other issues such as getting to health um, needs. So it, it varies and I have to. I need to come back because I want to go out to Melajuda because I've said to them that I would come and visit them after the closure of uh, the climb Yeah. and I want to have a yarn with them about the future of their children Yeah. because getting kids to school is important. What is your focus? What is your department's focus in 2020? Is it a a stronger focus, which you have done this year, on Indigenous businesses, Indigenous employment? It's also reducing suicides and tackling that issue. Let me say that in the Kimberley and Darwin at the round tables, I have seen an incredible shift of the way in which people are working together. Uh, I think the 
invitation to Minister Files to co-chair that roundtable with me has made a difference and I welcome her involvement. The other is the relationship I want to have with State and Territory Ministers for Aboriginal Affairs. Yeah. I want to try and bring us all together so that we have a common story, we'll have our differences, but the bottom line has to be how do we as leaders in the political area make a difference for an Aboriginal child or a family on the ground. It's not easy, it's going to be challenging. The other will be how do we get more of our kids to school? Because I know I see kids wag school, but the trouble is the world is becoming much more technological. Uh, they're needing less people to work in some of the jobs in some industries. I don't want our people left out of this, so we're going to have to talk about how do we get our kids back into school and to do well. Uh, and that's a major challenge. Yeah. Quite recently, uh, Prime Minister Morrison has restructured the government departments going from 18 to 14, you know, to make the government more efficient. Uh, what will your department be doing in 2020 to get the outcomes and projects that you want? Well, there are a set of priorities and the department is required to work on those. They're also required to work with our people in a very different way. I'm talking about code design. I don't mean that a public servant comes out and tells a community what they're doing. I need us to sit down on the ground and talk with the community about what we both want and what we can both deliver and what do we believe the outcome should be. That's what code design is. You plan it together. So that's a priority for them. But the other is working across every other government agency to make sure those departments are thinking about how they include our people in their programs, their services and their funding. This is a whole of government approach. It's going to be challenging, but we have to think differently and we're going to have to make some tough decisions. If people are not delivering, our community should be saying, well, why do you exist? I heard the story of an elderly Aboriginal man having to walk in heat to a medical service and he walked a fair distance. He walked from an outlying community. Now, we shouldn't be having that happen. We need to rethink the way we deliver, rethink the way we engage and really turn our organisations into proactive bodies that better serve our people. I really want to talk about the arts, but... <laughs> no, you can talk about the arts, that's fine. Just because I saw that uh, commun a communication and an arts got put into that super mega department. Do you, you think that the arts are going to suffer because of that? I feel like they've just been lost in those major things. In those no, 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 it won't be lost. So I've been a public servant and I've been involved where we've had what we call MOGS, Machinery of Government, where you bring departments together. The programs and the funding remains. It's just that you don't have a director general that you report to anymore or a, the number one person in the department. Yeah. You now have somebody else who's in charge and they report to the head of the mega department. Yeah. But that didn't change a single program or a single grant. And with Minister Fletcher, Paul Fletcher, who I work very closely with, I know that he will focus on the arts and will continue to push for the needs of the uh, whole arts area. And I've been impressed with uh, my colleague in his commitment to the arts, but more importantly, his commitment to Indigenous art. He went out to APY lands for himself and had a look and had a series of meetings and came back and we're working together on dealing with fake art. Oh, yes. Dealing with... A registration of Indigenous art that shows it is the genuine product, not a copy. Yeah. And the art code is not working, so we're going to work on that with Minister Fletcher. Because what we want people to have is an understanding when they buy Aboriginal art, it's genuine. Yeah. It's done by one of our people and it tells the story of that person, not a copy that has been done in another country. Yeah. Uh, so we're working on that at the moment. And I want to get rid of the carpetbaggers, the people who make a profit but give little back. And I've, I've seen the, the way in which some carpetbaggers have worked over a period of time and I don't uh, appreciate them doing what they do. Uh, but where they do go in and they buy at the proper rate and they are respectful 
and they provide the funding back to the artists, then that's a normal commercial arrangement. But we've got to put in place protections. So don't, don't worry about the arts. Yeah, yep. The arts will be great. Great. <clears throat> Let's not worry about the arts. What are the problems that we need to tackle in 2020 in regards to getting kids into our schools, women, Aboriginal women and domestic violence, um, and getting more permanent employment in our remote communities? How are we going to beat that? How are we going to tackle that in 2020? Let me take violence against women and the missing women's report that people are talking about. What, What really impacts is we've always looked after our families. Why have we done this sudden change where we beat our women? In some circumstances, not every male does that, but some men do. Why do they do that? I understand jealousy can be a factor. And, I, and I've seen that happen even in my own family. But to beat somebody who is not as strong as you is not what I would expect of a man or a warrior. We should be protecting. And where somebody does the wrong thing, we as men have got to stand up and say, hey, that's not right. There's no need to do what you're doing. Because you know the worst part about this is our kids witness the violence and think it's acceptable. So our sons then grow up thinking it's all right to treat their wife that way when it's not. Women who are missing... We need to do some more work on that. Uh, I've been looking at some figures here in Australia. And depending on when you Google uh, and look at some of the figures, they vary substantially. So we need to look at why that's happening and where that's happening. Because in some circumstances, some women do disappear deliberately uh, because of the circumstance they're in and they don't want people to know where they are. But I am very keen to look at how many of those are missing permanently that we don't know where they are. Uh, Because you'd have to consider uh, what are the other elements that come into play there, whether it's foul play or not. Mm. So violence is one that we we collectively have to challenge. And I would ask our men to step up and start to become uh, the warriors that they once were. And I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. We just have to protect our women and our children. The other issue of employment and jobs is always going to be challenging in remote communities. But I think here in the Territory, given the amount of land that is in the hands of our people, we should be looking at the economic opportunities. If it's pastoral land, let's start breeding cattle because China wants our meat. I used to buy a T-bone steak, which is one of my favourite steaks. I used to pay $7.50. I'm now paying $28 for that same T-bone. That's one. That's one. So think of all those T-bones on those cattle out there that we could have on our pastoral stations and community getting money for it. But we also have to look at some other opportunities as well, including tourism. I need to look at CDP. And I want to look at some options for that, but I want to work with community on, on when we do that. The issue around the cashless debit card, it's here. Uh, but what we do in those processes is communities are asked if they want to be on it. Now, the Northern Territory, unfortunately, went through the intervention. And so you have in place programs. Now, I think there are two things that work here in the Territory. One is the card has worked in, in terms of reducing alcohol consumption, but I think the Health Minister's approach and the Northern Territory Government's approach also has had an impact, so there's been a double impact. But up here, the men have raised some issues with me around how they're perceived given the report that was done before the intervention. And they say, we protect our kids. There are people who don't, but it's not every man. It's just some individuals. And we shouldn't tar everybody with the same brush. And I agree with them on that. So there's work we've got to do in that regard. Are you uh, going to be working with state and territory detention centres, youth detention centres with a strong Indigenous uh, incarceration rate to help reduce, get our young men and women not going straight to jail but to go into programs 
Uh, look, we need to do that. We need to look at diversionary programs. Uh, but I want to backtrack for one moment. I, I went to an Aboriginal organisation in Kalgoorlie. I asked them where they got their staff from and they said, we employ people who've been in prison. Not all people, but we employ a number of people who've been in prison. I said, so how do you overcome the issue of somebody with a criminal record given the way the public reacts? And they said, we use three R's, but one of them that really impressed me was recency. And I said, okay, tell me what recency means. I knew what they meant. But they said they look at the, the crime the person's done and when did it when did they do it? And what they shared with me is that when they employ them, they become the most loyal workers in the organisation because they've been given an opportunity and they're doing professional development to improve their skills and working their way up through the organisation into roles. Now, in the past, they wouldn't have had that chance. And that's what we need to look at because when you think of remote communities... And I did this as a kid, even in a country town. We used to drive vehicles without a license, not on the roads, but in paddocks. Yeah. And then sometimes you'd forget and you'd cross over a road. Now, if I'd done that and I'd been caught, then I would have ended up with a serious charge. I've been working with Christian Porter. One of the things I want to do is talk to him about diversionary programs, which take our kids out of the jail system and put them into working places and working roles Um, because to incarcerate you're putting a blot on somebody's life and if they're minor offences then let's not mark them I'd rather see a young man or a young woman be given an opportunity and to take their place in their community but also within the workforce of the Northern Territory And with the Northern Australia strategy, I'm working with Minister Canavan about economic opportunities up here uh, because it it will make a difference and that's what's important. Let's talk about safer communities and communities being able to trust in their emergency services. How, How in 2020 can we make those partnerships with communities and the police force and the ambulance service so it's not so hostile i i look well when the events at yondamu happened i met with in a closed meeting with a couple of the elders and we talked about that and we talked about when people go into communities i know there is cross-cultural awareness training that's done at the university or at an institution but i said to them how would you feel <clears throat> if we change that? And on the first day that I was appointed to your community as a police officer or as an AMBO or as a nurse or whatever, that I, was, I needed to sit with the elders for half a day and get the story from the elders about the community, about the way in which that community uh, operates, who are the key people in terms of the traditional owners and the elders and how do the organisations work with the community? Because that would give me a better understanding than doing just cultural awareness here in Darwin or in a capital city. I had a talk with the Chief Minister about doing this with um, at Yundamu and possibly in other communities in the future. He was very receptive, and I want to acknowledge uh, that fact. Uh, and he and I will catch up and meet again and have a discussion. But the elders were receptive, because they said, well, that gives us a chance then to have a proper yarn with the person who's coming into our community. And they, they, they said they want to work with people. <clears throat> they don't want what's happening. They don't want tension between health services and a community. They don't want tension between a school and a community. Nor police in a community. But there'll be other agencies as well. We're going to have to learn to work differently but at the same time still deliver what we're responsible for delivering. So the Commonwealth has certain responsibilities, but the bulk of what we've been talking about sits with state and territory governments. Minister, is there anything else you would like to cover? I just want to see our people uh, do as well in every other area of our lives as our sportsmen and women do. So our sportsmen and women are outstanding. They, 
they excel. I, I look at some of the footballers that have come from the top end here. Basil Campbell, I remember watching him when he played for South Romano, in particular in a game against Claremont, he was tough. But he was a fair footballer. And I've seen many footballers come from here. Um, and then all the Nyunglars that play football in the AFL. But I see women. Uh, there's three young women here from uh, a community in the top end who will probably end up playing with the Matildas. John Moriarty runs a football program. Yeah. And already one of them is playing with a Sydney club. But I'd love to see us do that in every other area of work. Mm. Doesn't matter whether we're sitting behind a microphone mm. or whether we're in a job with a government department. We shouldn't cruise. What we should be doing is showing our abilities our and being role models to our nephews and nieces. Uh, there was a man in New Zealand, Alan Duff, who decided to write a book on heroes. He focused on historical heroes and then sporting heroes. But then he started to go to towns and he said the kids there weren't talking about those heroes, they were talking about local heroes. And one that really struck me was a Maori man who had a fishing boat. He would go out and fish but he would save 10% of what he caught and sold it to create scholarships and he provided scholarships to the kids in that town. And they saw him as the hero. In another location, it was an auntie who was always there for the kids if they had problems. That's who the heroes are. And in our communities, we've got a lot of heroes. Mm. But we don't acknowledge them in the same way that we give adulation to a sportsman or woman. Our elders give us wisdom. But the one thing that I want us to do is stop playing games. Sometimes people play the games for reasons that I sometimes wonder about. Yeah. So they played the political game. Yeah. Um, we've got to talk about what are we going to change on the ground. Governments alone cannot do it. People will say to me, but you, you're, you're in charge, you're the minister. I don't live in the community. The most powerful people in that community are the leaders of that community. They're the ones who make a difference. I once said to a group of health workers in New South Wales, because it, I'd gone up to Lismore and I met all the Aboriginal health workers and I was a Nyunga man in Dungari country. So I used to go around and shake hands with everybody first just to acknowledge I was on their country. Yeah. But one Aboriginal health worker kept calling me sir. And I stopped when I was talking. I said, let me come and kneel down beside you. So I put my arm beside hers. I said, what's the difference between your arm and my arm? And she looked at me. And then, you know how we get that cheeky smile? She gave me a cheeky smile and said, your arm is area. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, there's no difference. I said, so forget about a title. Because yeah. you and I are here to do the same job. But I said that the Aboriginal health workers were the most powerful people in the health system of New South Wales. Because in their town, they knew every family. Mm. They knew and could influence them. Now, I was based in Sydney as the Director of Aboriginal Health. I didn't have the same influence. The power sits with our people in the community, the Aboriginal education workers. They're more powerful than, than a Director General. It's just that we have a title in a system. We've got to start believing that we are the masters and missuses of our destinies. And when we sit opposite people, we should never be nervous. We should look at them as another person who you're going to have a yarn with about making a change. And that's what I want us to see. Not to play the games, but to look at it and say, OK, what do I need to do for the people of my community and the kids in my community? Our kids are our future. So let's do what our parents one did, once did for us. Put aside the games, focus on a better future for our children and a better outcome for our community. We have to combine. We aren't different peoples, we are one people, one mob, one tribe. Well, thank you.
Minister White, for coming into the Larrakia Radio Studios as well as Aboriginal Broadcasting Australia to talk with me today about just your whirlwind 2019. I very much look forward to sitting down with you in 2020. No, we'll do that and it'll be great to have another yarn with you, Rachel. Take care. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year too. Yeah, same to you and same to all the listeners. Have a uh, a great festive season. I hope Santa comes bounding across with the boomers and visits you. Um, but have a great time together as family because that's what's best about Christmas. And for those of us who visit our churches, pray for better futures and better outcomes for our people. Mm-hmm.